Assalamu alaikum uh, for those um, other visitors. Um, we are very happy <laughs> to have a very um, highly esteemed and um, a very dear friend of the museum, uh, Dr. Farish Noh with us um, this morning to be able to go a bit deeper into some of the themes that uh, for this particular latest exhibition that we're putting up, Sirina Pese, um, to bring to life in many ways uh, some of the, the topics that we have started to highlight in the exhibition. Um, Sirina Pese is um, part of a series that MHC has been doing since 2014. Um, part of the Senusantara series of the same archipelago. And what we are trying to do here, when we look further into what is Malay in the Singapore context, um, in the Singapore experience, is really to open up, unpack this notion of what is Malay, to look at the rich diversity and the very particular histories of each of the community um, that have come um, and made Singapore home. And what we really are not trying to do is to reinforce stereotypes. Okay, so that is the main message that we are trying to put out uh, in our exhibition and in our programming. Uh, as much as the centre is the Malay Heritage Centre, right? heritage is itself quite fraught with a lot of contestations. What is tradition? Uh, what is our culture? And being in Singapore, you cannot deny the impact that larger um, global history has had on the creation of identity, whether it's a national identity, whether it's a group identity or personal identities. So the idea of identity politics, identity making, is something which is very dynamic. It is something that is constantly being looked at, reworked, um, defined, redefined. Um, and also we take very much of it is not some highbrow, you know, um, talking about uh, intellectual ideas, that's on the one hand, but it's really your personal experience, your family experience, what you grew up uh, listening to the stories within the community, uh, what your father, what your mother, what your grandparents told you, and what you share, and what you take with you, and what you, what's the word, you censor, <laughs> you suppress, <laughs> You know, and you forget, yes, thank you very much. So the idea of, of what is remembered and what is forgotten is also very much a part of what we try to show out um, in our modest galleries. And I hope you, you approach the spirit of, um, of what we do here, the curating here really has different entry points into learning more about how the different communities that we work with view themselves. Because this is co-created content. Okay, and we do our best to respect the views um, and the memories of that community and we try to show it with objects as well and the stories coming from them and their memories. And I'm definitely no expert at this, so let's leave it <laughs> to the expert in the room here, Dr. Farish now. You can see how low tech I am. I don't even know how to turn on a microphone. Uh, <clears throat> uh, thank you very much uh, for this kind invitation. I'm very happy to be here to talk to you about uh, the historical construction of identities. I'd like to, to, to pick up uh, on Lily's point earlier about remembering. Uh, let's look at the etymological roots of the word remember, to remember, to put together the broken parts of a body. Um, the very idea of remembering, to remember, to put back together, already implies a number of things. A kind of originality or a singularity that has been lost, but a singularity that is also complex and internally differentiated and diverse, and thereby able to be actually put apart, taken apart and put back together again. And I think that's the dynamics of identity that 
is often missing in the context of the kind of world that we live in today, this very modern world uh, where identities have, in a sense, become solidified and almost commodified. I want to get to that at the conclusion of what I want to say, but I was invited to talk about the colonial construction of identities in Southeast Asia and Bugis identity in particular. So as a historian who, whose focus uh, has been 19th century colonial history, I'm very happy uh, to touch on this subject. But let's, let's ground our discussion first, and, and, and let's look at how we, we talk about identities and how we can talk about identities. Uh, identities in terms of identities of communities, of places, of where and what we are. Where are we? Where is this discussion taking place? It's taking place in Kampung Glam, Singapore, in the middle of Southeast Asia. The microphone I'm holding, however, which I still have yet to master, um, does not know that it's in Singapore. I assume that this chair that I'm sitting on also does not know that it's in Singapore, nor does this table or this piece of paper in front of me. So where is Singapore? Where is Southeast Asia? Where is Asia? The first working premise that I want to present to you is that identities, in terms of collective identities, individual identities, and identities of places, are always ideational constructs. If you ask, where is Asia? This carpet is not in Asia. The carpet doesn't know it's in Asia. So where is Asia? Asia is in us. Asia is in us. We as thinking human subjects, we are the bearers of identity. Not our bodies, not objects, not things. We are Asians because we think as Asians. If you don't think as an Asian, you're not an Asian. Yeah? So, when we then talk about how identities in Asia, Southeast Asia, have been constructed over time, we need to go back and, and, and understand who were the bearers of these identities? Who were the bearers? Who, who, who bore the idea of Asia? And they are Asia and they are Asias. They are different understandings of Asia. And the sort of understanding that we seem to have lost is an understanding of a sort of pre-modern, pre-colonial Asia, which in so many ways I think has been captured very, very well in the work of um, the historian K. N. Chowdhury. I, I strongly recommend, if you have the time, uh, to read his Asia Before Europe, uh, an excellent book that tries to historically reconstruct an Asia before the impact of colonialism. And what Chowdhury does in his book is that he presents a view of Asia like this. This is Munster's map, Sebastian Munster's map of Asia, um, 1598. And in the kind of socio-economic world that Chowdhury constructs in his work is one where we see that Asia, as understood by Asians, was a polycentered, polynuclear regime, uh, sorry, region, <laughs> region, without borders, without fixed notions of territoriality, where communities mix, mingle, migrate, settle, where cultural, linguistic, economic, political, civilizational overlapping took place constantly. This is the kind of fluid Asia that today, you know, we talk about in the age of globalization because we can, now everyone can fly as we are told. We can fly about Asia and we are very happy that it's easy for ASEAN citizens in particular to be able to travel around Southeast Asia. And we celebrate this as a kind of great modern innovation. Whereas we forget that prior to the 17th century, this is how Asians lived anyway. Asians were constantly moving. And with that, there emerged an understanding of identity and belonging and place that was rooted in the organic realities of Asian society. Now this changes, of course, as a result of the colonial encounter, because with the colonial encounter, what happens is 
these local indigenous belief systems, these local indigenous knowledge systems, the local epistemologies and the local geographies eventually get superseded by a Western Occidental way of looking at things and the way in which Asia gets framed. Today we are in Southeast Asia. Now just consider this for one second. Southeast Asians were not the ones who declared that Southeast Asia is in, in the Southeast of Asia. Yeah, this is, these are geographical coordinates that we did not choose. So who, who decides? Who decides? Who decides that we are in Southeast Asia? From our point of view, Southeast Asians always regarded themselves as the center of the world. So China is East Asia. India is West Asia from our perspective. But that's gone. That's gone. Because we had, from the 17th, 18th, 19th to 20th centuries, the clash of different belief systems, different geographies, different epistemologies, where one side won and the other side lost. And with this emerges another Asia, an Asia that is viewed through the Occidental lens, an Asia that is constructed and understood ideationally as a thing, ontologically a thing. Asia is a place, a thing populated by Asians. And in the process of that, identities get frozen. And that's really what I want to talk about today. So from Munster's early map that gives us an impression, a very vivid impression of an interconnected, overlapping, fluid Asia, we begin to see also at the same time some of the earliest Orientalist depictions of Asia as it was imagined by the Occident. So people often talk about the colonial era in, as, as a singularity, and it's not. I mean, my argument is that we can actually distinguish three different periods of colonial contact. There's the early period of contact, where in the 16th century and 17th century, we have a slowly emerging Europe. And it's a weak Europe. It's a weak Europe. London was a kampong. Yeah? Yeah. This is a weak Europe trying to find its way, trying to understand this bigger continent of which Europe is a peninsula, and trying to understand Asia. From the 16th and 17th, we move to the 18th century, where Europe begins to advance, and as it advances, it gains something that it never had. It gains a technological edge over Asia. But at the early stage, this is Munster again, we already begin to see how Westerners, Europeans, began to imagine Asia. And if you look at those two rather interesting figures over there, that's what Asians look like uh, in the late 16th century. With this, of course, emerged a distinctly Occidental understanding of Asia. The word itself, where does the word Asia, Asia, come from? This is a quote from Johannes Burmes. Asi, the second part of the there we're in, do we have said that the whole earth is divided, took name as some whole opinion of the daughter of Oceanus and Tithys named Asia, the wife of Nephitus and the mother of Prometheus. Now, Asians should perhaps you know, derive some comfort to know that we are all descendants of Prometheus. Um, or as others affirm, of Asius, the son of Maine and the Lydian. And it stretches itself from the south between the, by the east into the north, having on the west part the two floods, the Nilus and Tanaeus. Basically, this is, um, Bemis is, is, is a hugely interesting uh, uh, scholar. His work, Omnium Gentium Mores, was perhaps one, perhaps one of the first European accounts of, of the non-Occidental, non-Western, non-European world, and it's regarded by some as perhaps the first work of anthropology. Um, there's a section in uh, the work where later on he talks about the non-European other, namely the people of the Indus, Indians, and compares and contrasts. So from a very early stage, as the Occident encounters the Orient, the Orient is framed as the other. This othering process takes place almost instantaneously, and this is one of the paradoxes of the politics of identity. You know, as much as we want to think of identity politics in terms that are benign, it is often grounded in dialectics. And this dialectics initially is me and you, us and them, but 
as I'll show, by the time we get to the 18th and 19th centuries, it becomes an oppositional dialectics. It's not me and you, it's me against you, it's us against them. It changes because that dialectical framing of the other as the other has already paved the way for opposition. And there are reasons why this interaction with Asia changes over time. Now, of course, when... <clears throat> I mean, Asia, Asia, Southeast Asia has always had contact with the rest of the world. We know this. Yeah? The exhibition, uh, which I encourage all of you to, to have a look at, if you haven't already, shows very clearly that in almost all communities and societies in Southeast Asia, there has been long, prolonged contact, cultural exchange, economic exchange, exchange of languages uh, across uh, Asia. So, so encountering other societies is not new. It's not, never been new. But the encounter with Western Europe from the 17th century onwards changes because Europe, as it emerges from the Dark Ages, is seeking prominence in global affairs. But at that early stage, when Europe is still small, we begin to see the first attempts of Europeans to reach out to Africa, the Arab lands, um, the rest of Asia, and you know, when people talk about you know, colonialism, 300 years of colonialism, that's not entirely true, because in the first century, when the Spanish and the Portuguese first arrived to South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, we know for a fact that their settlements were small, they were weak, they were highly dependent on trade. Even when the Portuguese and Spanish arrived, for example, they needed to trade. So they built tiny, small, trading settlements, and they were part of a wider mosaic of competing and sometimes cooperating trading centers. Even when the Portuguese conquered Malacca, right, it still had to trade to survive. And a lot of people forget that the Portuguese, during their 100 years of, of controlling Malacca, were highly dependent on trade with other Southeast Asian polities. They had to trade with Aceh, Padir, Johor, Riau, because otherwise they could not make that profit that they needed. So they were small. Also, another important uh, observation that has to be made is that when the Europeans first came to Southeast Asia, they did not have the technological advantage that they had later as a result of the Industrial Revolution. So when the Portuguese invaded Malacca, for instance, it took them eight days to defeat the Malaccans. Why? Because in terms of technology, the people of Malacca had the same kind of technology technology that the Portuguese did. After the defeat, they counted 8,000 guns in Malacca of Southeast Asian manufacturer. And Alfonso de Albuquerque the Younger, the son of Alfonso Albuquerque, wrote in his book that the guns of Southeast Asia, the guns of Malacca, were as good as the guns made in Göttingen, Germany at the time. So you see, what we have up to the 17th century is equality in terms of technology, of economic prowess between Asia and the West. Now, because of that, even with this early encounter, the Europeans who came to Southeast Asia had to understand and work with and navigate their way through a Southeast Asian conception of homeland. Tanah air. This is a word that we find in Malay, we find it in Indonesian. And this reminds us, today we still talk about tanah air, tanah air saya. You know, we don't say tanah saya, it's tanah air saya. Why? Tanah air for me is a very, very important concept that reminds us of a very different notion of geography, very un different understanding of how Southeast Asians understood their sense of belonging and their domain, where their homeland was. And this linking of land and sea is something that we fi find in many communities. And here is where the Bugis come in. The Bugis, like the Bajau, like the Suluks, like the people of Palawan, like the Ilanuns, there are many communities in Southeast Asia with a different sense of geography, whereby homeland is not just land, but sea as well. And this is why I think one of the things we've lost today, partly as a result of technology, because nobody takes boats anymore, everybody wants to fly instead, um, we've lost that tactile contact with the sea, which used to be part of our territory. The sense of belonging to the sea.
And when you look at the communities of Southeast Asia, not only the Bugis, but if you look at Bajalaut, for example, who uh, live very near to Sulawesi, we see foundational myths that link them very closely to water as well as land. All these geographies, all these cosmologies would eventually be forgotten. It would be forgotten. It would be forgotten because of the impact of new ideologies and new worldviews, new geographies that would eventually erase local understandings of belonging and place. Bajau Laut, for example, are interesting. Most communities have one myth of origins. You know, we came from there, we came from that mountain, or we came from that valley. And Bajau Laut have three origins. It's a community that from the outset, from its genesis, claim that they have come from the Straits of Malacca, the Sulawesi Sea, and the Sulu Sea. And until today, in the oral history of the Bajalao, <clears throat> there is a belief that every person has a twin living underwater. And that's why you cannot be far from water. When you're far from water, you're far from your home. Water is home. Um, which is a good excuse, by the way, to buy beach property, if you like. <coughs> right. Now, eventually, all of this gets, gets, gets erased because this notion of tanah air, you know, is superseded by another understanding of territoriality when Southeast Asians cannot claim and control their land as well. Now, the maritime history of Southeast Asia, I'm very happy that in this exhibition there's a boat there. <clears throat> the, the exhibition is laid out like a boat. It reminds us that the boat was also home. Now, the reason why our maritime history is so important is that it, it's not simply romantic stuff for those of you who like Pirates of the Caribbean and Johnny Depp and all that, but you know, it's not just that. Maritime movement <clears throat> accounts for how and why Southeast Asian polities emerged the way they did. For instance, uh, historians, myself included, cannot explain why certain kingdoms just disappeared. If you look at Southeast Asia's history, yeah, we have you know, the land-bound kingdoms, Majapahit, the Mataram, you know, Pegu, Pagan, you know, um, Ayutthaya, Sukhothai. You have maritime kingdoms as well, Malacca, you know, Jambi, Aceh, uh, Makassar. These are maritime kingdoms. But if you look at Southeast Asian history in a broad sense, you'll find that some kingdoms just disappear like that. And you don't know why. Why, why did they disappear? They were not invaded. Yeah, there was no large uh, invasion from, from India or the Mongols or, or from China. But how, why did some kingdoms just fade away almost in one generation? One possible theory or thesis would be that this reflects our maritime mobility. In other words, how did Southeast Asians live? Southeast Asians sought stability, safety and prosperity. So they would be drawn to flourishing kingdoms that were well governed. And you note that throughout Southeast Asian history, unlike you know, other large land-bound kingdoms like China that went through long revolts, long rebellions, there were very few rebellions in Southeast Asia. And one possible answer for that is because when there was a period of, say, instability or bad rule, bad governance, Southeast Asians just did the simplest thing. You pack everything in your boat and you go to the next kingdom, right? So that's how we voted. We voted with our feet or rather with our boats, right? So our maritime history is very important for us because it constantly gave us the opportunity structures to support or withdraw support from states that were either functioning well or being governed well or not. So that was a form of, you know, passive resistance. And it's linked very much to our culture as well. So Southeast Asians move and move and migrate. And in the history of the Bugis, which you have here, you make an important point that often in the context of a community, like in the Bugis community, when, for example, your ambitions are thwarted because your, your avenue for, for upward social mobility is blocked, you move. And we have this among the Bugis, we have this among the Bajau, we have this among the Suluks, we have this among the Minangs, that constant movement. That gave Southeast Asia its identity as a fluid and very dynamic part of the world, which also, unfortunately, made it a magnet for conquest later. And because of that, um, 
Southeast Asian identity would eventually come to be reconfigured, redefined by those who had the power to do so. By the time we get to the 17th century and early 18th century, we begin to see some of the first colonial orientalist depictions of Southeast Asians. So the first one that I know of is Theodore de Brie, 1601, where we begin to see the first images of, of Asians presented in a realist manner for a Occidental audience or European readership back home. These are images from Johannes Neuhoff, uh, Voyages to Brazil and uh, the East Indies, 1685. Now, the important turn that takes place in the 17th through 18th century is the emergence of a new institution, the modern colonial company. If earlier, during the time of the Portuguese and the Spanish uh, arrival, they were driven by simple commercial goals, modernity emerges in Europe with the, creation, with the creation of these modern companies, the Dutch East Indies Company, the British East India Company, the French Compagnie des Ondes. Now, they are very modern institutions in the sense that they are governed on the basis of the principle of contract, contractual relations. And as these second generation of European colonialists came to Southeast Asia, after the Spanish and the Portuguese came the British, the Dutch, and later the French. As they came to Southeast Asia, they brought with them a new, modern understanding of the world around them. They understood themselves in very distinct and fixed terms. What, what, what a lot of people um, may or may not realize is that the birth of the modern colonial company marks the birth of modern Western nationalism. When the British East India Company was created, not only was an institution, a modern militarized company created, yeah, given the right to conquer and kill for the mother country, but a corresponding set of legislation was passed in England, which made the East India Company an English company. For instance, laws were passed in Parliament forbidding an English merchant from working with any European in the East Indies. It was illegal because the East India Company serves England. It doesn't serve France, it doesn't serve Spain, it doesn't serve Holland. So legislation was introduced in the Parliament of England stating that if an English merchant was out here in Southeast Asia trading, with Southeast Asians, but if on the way back he took a Dutch ship, his entire cargo would be confiscated and profits taken away from him. So Englishness becomes defined. Dutchness becomes defined, fixed. So the complexity of European identity also gets reduced. Europeans become increasingly homogenous. An Englishman can only be an Englishman, a Dutchman can only be a Dutchman. And in the process of that, as they saw their identities fixed, so did they see the identities of others fixed as well. And this is where we begin to see the beginnings of 17th century colonial scholarship on Asian identities. So in Neuhoff's work, Neuhoff writes a lot. It's an enormous book. Um, you can hit someone with this book. It's really heavy. But it's accompanied by these amazing images, and these are um, some of the first images we have. And Neuhoff already begins to identify, you, you are Jawa. You, you are Bugis. You, you are Chinese. You, you are Sumatran Malay. And he fixes them, and he fixes them not only in their description, he fixes their description, but he fixes them through the imagery that accompanies them. And in Neuhoff's work, Neuhoff wrote his, his work in, uh, in the 1680s. He was a Dutch East Indies company man based in Batavia, then under Dutch rule. And he does a survey. He surveys everything. He surveys all the fruits, the plants, the animals. His book is, is a fantastic book to read in terms of its visual imagery. There's every species of fish that he could find or eat, every species of bird that he could find or eat, every species of fruit, vegetable that he could find or eat, uh, people he didn't eat, lah, you know, but every type of community that he found around him in colonial Batavia. And among them are these. This is his image of the urbanized Bugis. Yeah? 
Uh, Neuhoff's book is very interesting because when he talks about the population of, of Batavia, colonial Batavia, today Jakarta, he ranks them with the Dutch at the top and other Europeans and then the various communities. So you have the Javanese, you have the Batawi, you have the Sumatran Malays, you have the other uh, you know, Hadrami Arabs. There, there's even the first image of Africans in Batavia. People forget that there was a substantial community of Africans in Java in the 17th century because they were brought by the Dutch uh, through their colonial connections. And then he has the image of the Bugis. Now, here is where we begin to see Bugis identity slowly getting fixed. The Bugis, a seafaring people, a people whose notion of Tanah Air was very complex, belonging to Sulawesi, but the sea is their home as well. That eventually gets reduced, reduced, reduced to fix the meaning of what Bugis identity is. But even in Neuhof, there are two types of Bugis. There's the good Bugis and the bad Bugis. The good Bugis looks like this. You know? It's an urban merchant Bugis. You know, merchant man. And at this early stage, this is what the Bugis are known for in the 17th century, long before this stereotype of the sea rover, pirate, you know. Initially, in the 17th century, the Bugis are seen as merchants. And this is a merchant community in Batavia. He talks about their contribution to the Batavian economy, he talks about their trade and how they engage with trade and how they are important to the Dutch. The Dutch is in this company because these are good traders. They're good businessmen, and we can buy and sell from them. But corresponding to this image of the urbanized Bugis who live under Dutch colonial rule in an urban setting, there's also the other Bugis, which is this Bugis. And then you have the Bugis in Makassar. And this is, again, a colonial image. And why is this? Because, again, we have to understand the history. In the 17th century, Dutch control of what would later be Indonesia, the Dutch East Indies, was confined mainly to Java, Ambon, Ceram, the Moluccas. Yeah? Sulawesi was still very much independent, still out of the direct control of the Dutch. The Dutch could not control it, the British could not control it, because the Bugis were fiercely independent. Now, this resistance to attempts by the Europeans to encroach and control a Bugis identity, a Bugis uh, uh, homeland, of course, created one of the first stereotypes about the Bugis, the warrior, the fighters. And a clear dichotomy then emerges in the way in which Neuhof, as a functionary of the Dutch East Indies Company, imagines the various communities. And the Bugis, who formerly inhabited the diverse isles near that of Makassar, are a warlike people, armed with scimitars, arrows and shields, which they handle with great dexterity. They go for the greatest part naked, having only a piece of stuff about their middle down to their knees. I assume that's a sarong. Um, the women are clad like other Indians. Indians because Southeast Asia was then seen as part of India, Greater India, India Magnus. After the Dutch became engaged in the war with the king of Makassar, the Bugis fixed their habitations in and about Batavia till the event of the war. But after the Makassars were conquered by the Dutch under the conduct of Cornelius Spielmann and a firm peace was fitted, settled, both the king and queen had a house aligned to them in Lord Street. So basically, this passage shows the complex relationship between the Dutch East Indies Company and the Bugis people as a whole. On the one hand, we admire you because you are good merchants and traders, but at the same time, when we try to monopolize your economy, when we try to break into Sulawesi and gain a foothold in Sulawesi, you resist us. And at that point, you're no longer a good merchant, you become savage warrior other. And this is not only the fate of the Bugis. Every community from India to Southeast Asia suffered this. So we have this constant reconstruction of the image of the other. And this combination of text and imagery, I think, is extremely, extremely powerful. Of course, eventually, the Dutch do uh, 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 attack. Uh, this is from Wouter Schouten, 1708, a famous scene of the attack on Makassar. You can see above there, Makassar, where the Dutch and uh, the Makassaris uh, fight. The logic of colonial capitalism is that you have to conquer all markets. That's the point. It's very different from 
the time of the Portuguese and Spanish, where you have small outposts. By the time you have the Dutch East Indies Company, the British East India Company, and the French Company des Andes, you must conquer the entire region. Why? Because your adversary are not the natives. Your adversary are your fellow Europeans. You must take Sulawesi, because if you don't take Sulawesi, the British will take Sulawesi, or the French will take Sulawesi. So this is where, from the 18th century onwards, we see this mad rush. People talk about the rush, the scramble for Africa. Well, the whole of Asia became an open battlefield. And during this time, this is when the intense rivalry was not only between the Dutch and the Bugis in Sulawesi, but between the Dutch and the British and the French for hegemony across the entire region. And here, we already begin to see the important changes that will affect the relationship between West and East, the Occident and Orient, namely those ships. Western technology is growing faster and faster. So with better ballistics, better logistics, better ships, the capacity of these colonial companies to project power grows. And with that, that equality between East and West diminishes. It becomes more and more lopsided as the Western powers have the ability to actually defeat their opponents and conquer markets. The battles, of course, were extremely violent. And uh, if you look at the history of Southeast Asia, particularly in the history of the conquests of the various parts of Indonesia, you know, the violence was routine. Uh, when, when Cheram and Ambon were, were taken, for example, for the spice trade, the entire population of Cheram was wiped out. Yeah. So we're talking about mass mass extermination here. So some people like to romanticize uh, uh, the colonial period, you know, because they watch too many Merchant Ivory movies and you know, maybe watch Passage to India, or whatever, but, but, but don't, 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 f don't forget that it's a bloody process. It's a violent process, yeah? There's a lot of human loss, loss of human life. And so the big turn happens by the time we get to the end of the 19th century, sorry, the end of the 18th century, in the beginning of the 19th century, when by then, as a result of the Industrial Revolution, the technological advantage that the West has over Asia and Africa is almost absolute. And this is the birth of the era of the gunboat. And the era of the gunboat basically means that today we have, you know, by, by, by then, by the 19th century, you have the capacity to project power at an enormous human cost to the victim, but at a minimal human cost to the aggressor. So this leads to what we now call asymmetrical warfare. You know, it's not unique to Asia. We see the same stories in Africa. The, the creation of the Gatlin gun, you know, the modern machine gun, basically leads to you know, huge battles like you know, um, Omdurman, for example, where thousands of Africans are just massacred in a few minutes. And the use of these technologies basically renders Asia defenseless. This is the famous image of the attack on Brunei, uh, 1846, if I'm not mistaken. Now, it is in the 19th century then that that identity that we talk about, Boogie's identity, gets fixed even more. And why? Because following the logic of colonial companies, yeah, the need to conquer and domesticate and pacify markets and whole territories, not just land, but sea as well. The sea is a battlefield. Yeah? You must hold the sea. That supremacy, that naval supremacy that Britain, France, Holland, and later America, and also Japan would have, meant that that notion of Tanah Air is now disrupted. If Southeast Asians belong to land and sea, one thing that Southeast Asians lose in the 19th century is the sea, because you cannot defeat that kind of technology. The modern gunboat with the modern cannon, the modern howitzer, the modern machine gun basically meant that Holland, Britain, France were able to control the waterways of Southeast Asia, ending that fluid movement where the Bugis community, among other communities, found themselves, where they could go out and trade, merchant, move, settle, immigrate, etc., etc. You don't have that access anymore. The equivalent would be like today, if Southeast Asians do not control our skies and we cannot fly. That would be the equivalent. So with that, you have a new impetus 
Again, this is driven by intra-European rivalry. Britain wants to control the South China Sea. Holland wants to control the Malacca Straits and the Java Sea. So all these countries are trying to control the sea. Today, we're talking about you know, disputes in the South China Sea. It's not new. It's been going on for 300 years, right? But then, this is Keppel, Henry Keppel, um, writing in the mid-19th century. Without a continued and determined series of operations of this sort, he's talking about the war on piracy, it is my conviction that even the most sanguinary and fatal onslaughts will achieve nothing beyond a present and temporary good. The impression on the native mind is not sufficiently lasting. Their old impulses and habits return with a fresh force. They forget their heavy retribution. Till piracy be completely suppressed, there must be no relaxation, and well worth the perseverance is the end in my view. The welfare of one of the richest and most improvable portions of the globe and the incalculable extension of the blessings of Britain's prosperous commerce and hum humanizing dominion. In other words, Keppel, as a commander in the British Navy, taking part in the so-called war on piracy in Borneo in support of James Brooke, believed that the only way in which the civilizing influence of Western colonialism could be made permanent in Southeast Asia is through the dominance of the sea. Now, when that happens, all seafaring communities are instantly a target. So here comes the next stage in the invention of Bugis identity. If in the past the Bugis are seen as merchants, as traders, and as warriors, from the 19th century, the Bugis are seen as pirates. Piracy is a construct. You invent a pirate. And the birth of piracy coincides with the birth of colonial capitalism. The two emerge at the same time. Why? Because what is a pirate? We don't go to pirate school, right? You don't get a diploma in piracy. I think I'm going to be a pirate. You know, no, you don't. You are defined a pirate. You are defined a pirate. In the same way that in the past, the boogies were defined as warriors. By the 19th century, they're defined as pirates. Why? Because the logic of colonial monopolies is that if you don't trade with us, by default, you are a pirate. So all the communities of Southeast Asia that attempted to retain some degree of economic independence and continued their own traditional Southeast Asian patterns of trade were immediately defined as either a competitor or an enemy. And so the Bugis were not the only ones. The Bajaus were also defined as pirates. The Dayak Laut were defined as pirates. The Suluks were defined as pirates. So piracy, you see, is an invention. You are labeled a pirate. No one, no one is a pirate. You're not ontologically a pirate. You're not born a pirate. I hope not. You know, no one's born one. You're defined one. You're made one. You're labeled one. So the label of pirate comes attached to the Bugis, along with many other maritime communities of Southeast Asia, to serve this. To serve what? To serve the sustained, deliberate effort on the part of colonial companies to gain control and monopolize trade. So once you're our ally, that's all right. But if you don't work with us, by definition, you must be an enemy. So that oppositional dialectics gets stronger and stronger. And it wasn't just the boogies who were called pirates. Uh, this is a modern contemporary uh, depiction of, of uh, an event that took place in Sumatra in the 1830s. Uh, this was... America's entry to Southeast Asia. I've just finished my book on the uh, Americans in Southeast Asia from 1800 to 1900. And, and people always think that America's arrival in Southeast Asia begins with the conquest of the Philippines. Not true. 70 years before that, America's first attack in Southeast Asia took place in Sumatra. Why? For the same reasons. That American shipping was threatened, and in the American press at the time, there, were already the, there was already the, the creation of a new category, the Malay pirate or the Sumatran pirate. So you read the headlines of the newspapers then, you know, it's like war against the pirates of Sumatra. So Southeast Asia was full of pirates. Because basically a pirate is anyone who doesn't work with the dominant emerging European power. So Malays were labeled pirates, Bugis were labeled pirates, Orang Laut were uh, labeled pirates, Bajaus, you know, everyone. Anyone who did not cooperate. So, you see how the term piracy is so politically loaded. It's always been politically loaded because it's meant to serve a certain political economic agenda. So, we cannot get out of this because, unfortunately, these stereotypes remain with us. 
And so by the time we get to the late 19th century, these identities have become fixed. All the complexities, the complexities of Boogie's culture that you see in this exhibition, how Boogie society has its own internal complex hierarchies, its internal complex modes of internal differentiation, its, its, its variances of you know, worldviews, its conception of geography, all of which is very complex. All of that gets reduced, 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 until in the end, we end up with these sort of postcard caricatures. This is from uh, Frank Marriott's uh, voyage to Borneo and the East Indian Archipelago, where Marriott provides some of the first images of the natives of Southeast Asia. Marriott was, on the one hand, a naval officer, but at the same time, an amateur artist. And so he, he understood. Marriott is the one Orientalist scholar who really understood the power of images. He says this in his introduction. He says, one image can convey more than in pages and pages of writing, because that image fixes. He understood the power of the image is that it fixes you. It fixes you. And for me, these images are like butterflies that are pinned on a frame. They're fixed for good. Once I've labeled you pirate, you're stuck with that. Once I've labeled you headhunter, you're stuck with that. Once I've labeled you cannibal, you're stuck with that. And we labor under this long historical burden of a 19th century epistemology until today. The net result are the kind of, you know, um, ethnicized, racialized uh, studies of society that were very popular in the 19th century, coinciding, by the way, with the emergence of race theory in places like America, you know. Um, theories of polygenesis, that human beings are not one race, but actually we are different races, some are superior, some are inferior, etc., etc. And so it's this sort of scholarship which has, in a sense, trapped all of us, Southeast Asians, in so many ways. The writing of John Crawford, for example, is, is instructive in this regard. John Crawford's uh, book, 1820, um, The History of the East Indian Archipelago, History of Southeast Asia, divides Southeast Asia into five civilizational groupings, from the most civilized to the most uncivilized, right? So here's someone from London, arrives in Southeast Asia, and he sort of does this sweeping, broad categorization of all the communities of Southeast Asia. The most civilized for Crawford are the Javanese and the Malays of Sumatra, right? The second category are the Bugis and the people of Sulawesi and parts of Kalimantan, Borneo. And then there's a third category, even less civilized. And the final last category are the people of Papua. You know, so there are five rankings. Of course, not in that rankings are the Europeans who are above, because they do the rankings. Right? So, so what we see then in the 19th century until today is the way in which complexity has been reduced to essentialized traits and characteristics which are fixed. And all that mobility the way in which the many different complex ways in which we understood our world around us has been reduced to a terrestrial geography, a political geography, a political economy, which in many ways is very different from that of pre-colonial Southeast Asia. Why? Because it's modern. Not only because it's occidental, but because it's modern. It brings with it a sensibility that is alien to the belief systems of, of Southeast Asians. And so this leads us, I think, to the dilemmas that we face today, and I'll try to end with this. What I've tried to show here is that the Boogies were, in a sense, reconstructed in this long period from the 16th, 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries through colonial scholarship for specific reasons. We can see distinctively different stages in history where the Boogies were seen as merchants, then as warriors, later as marauders, then as enemy. Why? Each stage, the relationship between the West and the other changes. It changes as Western colonial capitalism grows stronger and stronger. My thesis is that we've never left the 19th century, unfortunately. Because until today, we still belabor all these categories that we've been lumped with. Now, I see several problems with this. And this is where my own personal concerns and my academic concerns coincide. First is, 
No, you know, we Asians uh, love to self-exoticize ourselves, right? We, we, we just, we, you know, give any opportunity and we all go, you know, native ethnic full blast, right? Um, so today, for example, uh, when they say, oh, come in your traditional dress, yeah? We come like this, right? Um, and why? Why? Because our capacity to define ourselves basically subsides, grows weaker as we come under the hegemony of another ideological, epistemolog epistemological belief system. So when we fall back, I mean, you, this, this is so common. It's all the way from, 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 from India all the way to China, we see this. Whenever they say, wear your you know, traditional dress or whatever, we revert back to the 19th century. Why? Because these images are fixed. They're fixed in our minds. They're in our postcards. They're in our popular culture. They're in our movies. Because this is how we imagine we ought to look like. Now, let me just throw this, this counterfactual uh, to you. My argument is that some of these Asians, Asians in the 19th century, dressed like this simply because that's what was in their cupboard. Right? Now, if some of these Asians in the 19th century were wearing jeans, that guy would be wearing jeans. Right? Because you wore what you wore. So why is it that we fall back to a specific 19th century orientalist construction of identity and not see that our identities are complex and evolving? We didn't always dress like that. Prior, 100 years before, we dressed differently. 200 years before, we dressed differently. Now, that dynamics of change has been lost because our identities have become frozen. The equivalent would be now if you go to like, uh, London and say, oh, you know, let's have an English ethnic dress. And suddenly, all Englishmen wear suits of armor or you know, Regency period dress or you know, Georgian dress. That would be rather stupid because English society has evolved. It's moved on. So likewise, Asian society has moved on. But in our understanding of identities, it remains... Essentialist, essentialist, reductivist, and fix. That's my, one, my, my first problem. The second problem is that, related to that, is the politics of identity that we seem to like to indulge in. So living as we do in this complex world today, of course, particularly in the complex context of plural societies, people often need to fall back on identity. I am this, I am this. This, for me, is personally a bit odd because I'm, I'm complete hybrid mama everything, you know, so I, 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 don't, I don't know which identity. Should I be Punjabi? Should I be Hadrami? Should I be Jawa or Dutch? So I don't know. But a lot of people want to fall back on something, right? And in the process of doing so, my concern is that we reproduce these stereotypes. And that's why I'm glad that this exhibition is trying to, con co you know, question that. Who are we? Hundreds of years of evolution and dynamics in Bugis community has made it one of the most complex and diverse and dynamic societies. This is what Neuhoff caught, you know, in his early images. So see how these Bugis, they are great merchants, they are travelers, they are merchants, they are dynamic, they are dynamic, they are dynamic. But that dynamism ends by the 19th century when they get reduced to a stock stereotype, a postcard image. And my third concern is that if we continue to repeat some of these colonial tropes, and, and, and themes, you know, whether it's uh, the Asian as savage, the Asian as cannibal, the Asian as headhunter. We forget that in the context of today's convoluted geopolitics, um, these tropes can also be damaging, especially to us. Now, I have one foot in the domain of security, so I deal with also terrorism, counterterrorism, political violence. I'm very worried when I read reports or analysis on piracy in Southeast Asia, and often, these are reports written today, yeah? but they often draw back from these colonial constructions of the past. You know, I've read some really silly analysis in recent years. You know, people saying like, oh, of course, piracy is a problem in Southeast Asia because they're all pirates. You know, and they've been pirate. They've been piracy for hundreds of years. And I thought, no attempt to 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 seriously interrogate how these terms came about. All right. So likewise, in the late 90s, when there was political disturbance in Southeast Asia during the financial crisis, a lot of societies were in, in, in turmoil. And again, I read analysis by so-called you know, experts, which is why I don't use that word, um, saying, oh, of course they go amok over there because amok is their culture. You know, they've been amoking for hundreds of years. 
where do you get this nonsense? The nonsense is the result of this long, long historical legacy, this borrowing and this constant reproduction of cliches and stereotypes that go back to the 19th century. So I think the reason why I think we need to go back and, and, and look at how these identities get constructed is because we, like any, like any people today, we are all, you know, we are human beings living in a modern, some would say postmodern world, fraught with challenges uh, and developments that we did not anticipate. Nobody saw the internet revolution, nobody saw the IT revolution. And of course, in a, in a context like that of rapidly changing societies, people become insecure. We need something to anchor ourselves. There's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with celebrating identity. What I would like to see is a more nuanced, a more historically informed, a more critically informed understanding of how complex identities are and that identities are actually created. We're not born with it, we are created, you know. If I randomly pick a child and I put that child in a particular society, that child will adopt the customs and norms of that society. It's not in us, it's not in our genes, it's something social. But because it's social, it's also historical, it has a dynam dynamics that we need to understand. Let us at least not fall into this trap of simple reductionism and in the process of doing so, forget how these identities were constructed. I'll end with this. Like it or not, all communities deal with identity, the Bugis community, along with others. Our identities, I think, have to be negotiated and defined by ourselves. But in order to do that, we need to know our own history and we need to be able to read our history critically. If we were to forget this long process, then what we are forgetting is empire. You're forgetting empire. And you're forgetting that identity construction, especially in the 19th century, was intimately linked to power, politics, colonialism, imperialism, and violence. And in forgetting that, you know, we allow these orientalist tropes to come back into circulation and we reproduce it, uh, I think, to our detriment, because in the end, it's we who lose out. We lose out in the sense that all that complexity that we are capable of as rational, sentient human beings gets reduced to the point where all of us become just cardboard, postcard caricatures. And I think that would be a sad ending to the history of Southeast Asia. Because for me, Southeast Asia has always been one of the most interesting parts of the world, one of the most complex parts of the world. And it's that complexity that I think we should celebrate. So I'll end there. Thank you.